for now, I am going to dive in here. So welcome. I am Morgan Philippi. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am currently an MPH student at the Gilling School of Global Public Health, and I am studying global health. And I am happy to be here with you all today at Activism in Action, Evolution of the Minority Student Caucus of the UNC Gilling School of Global Public Health. We have a panel of wonderful speakers and you'll get to hear some of their history throughout the presentation. And I don't wanna take away from their time by introducing them all, but I do wanna highlight that a lot of this has been spearheaded by Anita Holmes, who is one of our presenters here. And Anita was a founding member of the Minority Student Caucus and has, has had a bountiful career in public health. Um, so if you would, are interested in the other speakers' bios, I would direct you to their the brochure from the conference and they have comprehensive oh, files on how are you? Okay, so <clears throat> Anita, we need you to unmute, please. Thank you. And if at any time I need to speak up, please let me know. Well, thank you again, Morgan. And I thank you to all of the participants and all of the planners for this conference. This has been a great opportunity and a great time to reconnect with some of my classmates. So first, a disclaimer. The minority, or at that time, Black Student Caucus was founded in 1971. So that will tell you, this is about the 50th anniversary. So you are calling on almost 50 years of memory on my part. So that's my disclaimer, but I'm very thankful for all the materials that have been archived and so nicely kept in minutes uh, that you will meet later, Walter Isaacs kept as secretary of our group for most of that time. And I'm looking forward to sharing this platform with Delton Atkinson, who's just a little bit younger, he came a little bit later, uh, Vic Schoenbach, who has provided us so many historical materials and has been active for many years. John Hatch, many of you no, Keenan professor and also was working on his doctorate when I was there. Uh, and uh, you were here from uh, Ben Money, Deputy Secretary of Health, as well as I think I covered everyone. If I didn't, I'm going to get to you uh, directly. All right, we're gonna capture this history in a slide presentation and you will see that you should be seeing it now on your screen as we all get used to this virtual platform. And by the way, um, when I mentioned the disclaimer, one thing I want each of you to please do is help us with this memory. If you have memories of being at the school and the reflections you want to share, we hope to have time at the end, but we also would love for you to send us that information and we will provide materials at the last, with the last slide so you can connect with us. Next slide. You will see the founding members of the caucus to the right, Romulus Hudson uh, was the chair. And I used to say, oh, I could count the number of black students on my hand. So there were very few of us, but the diversity was uh, quite a, there was quite a mixed group. Some of us had lots of experience. That wasn't me. I was fresh out of undergrad, but others had worked in a number of prestigious positions before, and it really enhanced our ability to get things done. Next slide. You may wonder why am I starting with the 1940s if the caucus was founded in 1970s because that's a unique history. I want you to focus at least on the second bullet, the 1940s. Some of you are familiar with James Shepard or know of James Shepard. Uh, 
who is the founder and past president of NCCU, he actually had collaborated with Milton Rosenau, who was Dean of the School of Public Health, which first started in the School of Medicine on how public health education courses might be provided to students at NCCU at the master's level. And Lucy Morgan, one of the professors, headed that initiative. Some of you may have heard about a secret basketball game in 1944 between NCCU and Duke medical students at a time that segregation was right, was very active, I'm sorry. And so you can think about the secret journal club that Lucy Morgan held in which she had students from NCCU as well as the School of Public Health sometimes meeting in her home, sharing faculty and having sessions together. Uh, these students received a master's, I think it was in Master's of Science in Public Health. Next slide. Next slide. All right, thank you, Morgan. So the 1960s is the one right before that, Morgan. The 1960s, you'll see a list of the Black graduates uh, that actually preceded the 1970 founding of the caucus uh, with one of the first students, uh, Van Allen, that may be on this call, who received his doctorate in public health. And some of those students, uh, such as Bill Darity, also uh, went to Central. So there are some, some eagles floating about and I'll take claim to that too. All right, next slide. Okay, the formation of the caucus. So this all began at John Hatch's house. John Hatch was working on his doctorate and he's one of those students with some experience too. And he invited all of us at the time to his house for a picnic. And it started off as just a wonderful social occasion. And it remained wonderful. But what John did is about in way once we finished eating, John stood up and he may have taken us in the house, but I think we were still outside. And he just stated in his very methodical way, he thought it would be a wonderful idea for us to talk about ways that we might support each other. And that's really where it began. And we all agreed that we were wanting support. Some of us had come straight from undergrad, some from uh, historically black colleges and universities. So we were being switched quite quickly from majority role to minority in presence. And we decided we needed to have monthly meetings. Next slide. So what happened at those monthly meetings? First of all, we needed to unify as a group and develop a system, a support system. Excuse me, just a moment. And some of the concerns we talked about were first, the low percentage of minority students and faculty at the school. Now remember this was right after the 1960s, the civil rights movement, housing was an issue. And I remember that being on our agenda often, helping students find housing, financial support, social challenges, and a curriculum uh, that was diverse to talk about black health concerns. Uh, the, we also talked about roles and responsibilities. We felt we needed to organize. So a president was either selected or volunteered. Uh, and also we had things such as a resource committee. Next slide. <clears throat> So this slide looks very old and that's because it is. This is part of the original statement of concerns 
regarding the relevance and responsiveness of the School of Public Health to the needs of Black Americans. And this can be found in the archive. You can read the original document in the resources that we will share at the end. Next slide. This statement of concerns actually had a precursor, a rationale uh, for why we were presenting it to the then Dean of the School of Public Health, Dean Fred Mays, in June of 1971. Just as we talk about disparities now, we emphasize the magnitude and severity of the health problems that Blacks, African Americans were experiencing. And you'll notice the term Black, which was what was commonly used at that period. The input of Black professionals being needed at policy and planning levels and the obligation of the school to prepare for the training of black professionals. At that time, I think there was only one other school of public health in the South and we did point that out in the original document. Next slide. I'm gonna take some time with the uh, statement of concerns just because I think they're important. And I, I hear some of those concerns that uh, people have now that we want to progress, we want to continue. The goal was set of 25% proportion of black American students by September, 1975, the immediate employment of a black American to recruit black American students a goal of 10% proportion of black faculty by 1975, black professionals be utilized as resource persons and consultants at the school, that there be appropriate black representation in the planning and negotiation of special project research and services, special assistance be provided to black students similar to that being provided for foreign students and that the curriculum include courses geared towards individuals that would like to work in predominantly black settings. And that would be whether those individuals, white, black, or any other racial group. Next slide. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> Okay, so the next thing was we had our concerns that we had developed at the meetings. So now it's time to meet with the Dean. We sent a letter requesting a meeting with Dean Mays, which he responded to. And he suggested June 23rd, he was very cognizant of our schedule. So it was sent after normal class hours. Next slide. This is a copy, the first part of a statement that was summarizing the meeting that again is in the archives. Next slide. The main point that occurred at that meeting, I will say we walked into the Dean's conference room at this large table, the high back chairs, some of us students, but it was so welcoming, it wasn't really very intimidating. Uh, and we were, the first comments rather out of Dean May's mouth were that our ideas were well accepted, endorsed and many faculty agreed with those. And we came out of that meeting, there were faculty members there also, I forget the exact number, maybe, maybe 10 or 11, a sizable number. Uh, and many of them were persons who had supported recruitment of more Black Americans because there had been some memos and discussion of the need to increase the number of Black Americans, but we want, came in wanted to see how we could help this happen. How could we turn this desire into concrete action? So uh, we agreed that the appointment of a Black American uh, for a position 
to focus on uh, the recruitment and that there should be a goal, the Dean's Cabinet goal was 15% by 1972 and ours was 25% by 1975. But as you can tell, they are pretty compatible. We felt that students needed to be involved as well as faculty at each step. Um, it was important that these students received uh, stipends or some type of support. Uh, and also that the environment be conducive. And remember again, you see that housing uh, issue and the cu curriculum should emphasize our strengths and potentiality of minorities. At the time when we took foul statistics and epidemiology, we would sometimes kid among ourselves about, wow, wonder what we're gonna die from now or get sick from. And of course there were death, uh, health disparities and the courses were excellent, but we wanted to focus on strengths also. And last but not least, action now. Next slide. And communication was critical and we received regular communication uh, from the Dean and we sent communication to the Dean. So this is a correspondence from the Dean sent what about seven days since our meeting, which included the minutes of the meeting, the job description for the coordinator of minority affairs, which we took the first um, staff, so to speak, in writing, which was endorsed by the faculty and the Dean. And also uh, the Dean decided to invite a member of the caucus to regularly attend the Dean's cabinet meeting. Next. I won't go through this original job description again, you find in the archives, next slide. Okay, here are the key responsibilities and remember the basically the Dean gave the caucus responsibility for recruiting someone, for developing the job description, for interviewing the candidates, and then recommending a candidate or candidates. Uh, and we could narrow that down, as I recall, as much as we care to. Uh, the person would uh, report directly to the dean. It was important that this position be at a senior level. Uh, academic or administrative ties with departments. Uh, they would also coordinate other interests related to students and faculty from minority groups and their remain effective communication. Next slide. Okay. At the meantime, we still needed to take care and support the need of the students, those of us there of us there. So it would soon be time for a new class, a uh, new academic year. We developed an orientation session to go along with the orientation session that was developed for the school so that we hoped African-American students would participate in both. And the one by the caucus, for instance, would emphasize styles of instructors, talk about the caucus and the campus. It'd be very culturally friendly and appropriate. All right, uh, cookout, social occasions were important as you can tell, and they were important for the families of students and the students. Uh, monthly meetings continued to be held. We rotated to each other's homes. We could talk about share concerns, write social support make available materials uh, for individuals. And if people needed uh, additional support, that was there for them. Next slide. <clears throat> Meanwhile, coincidentally, we were working on our interviews for the coordinator. And let me summarize that Bill Small was the candidate of choice. He was endorsed. Um, and he was hired in, uh, was 1971, November, right at the bottom, 71. 
And many of you know uh, Bill. He was recruited initially by Romulus Hudson, the chair of the caucus who knew Bill. Bill had attended uh, School of Public Health, was an, a graduate of environmental sciences, and Romulus Hudson, who was in environmental sciences, knew Bill prior to uh, his becoming a student there. And several of us took on responsibilities to contact different candidates. Next slide. Uh, this received national attention this is in the American Journal of Public Health, Association News, next slide. The other thing was a black health course. Guy Stewart, who was head of health education and part of a group of faculty members who had been in South Africa and were against apartheid and were very supportive of students. They had, many of them had come here about the same time. Guy Stewart asked John Hatch if he would develop a course, a black health course, uh, and I was an undergrad, I'm not an undergrad, a master's level student along with Thornton Haynes and Sadie Graham. And we were to assist with that task with John being our lead. Uh, a course was designed. I cannot say it didn't change once John uh, continued to teach it. I'm sure he continued to enhance it but a course was designed and later, uh, some of you may even have taken a black health course uh, with John Hatch as professor. Next slide. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. We're still checking the date on this, but there was a minority advisory committee that was comprised of faculty and students as, um, from the archive materials that we see. And there was a letter to that group from the minority student groups. Uh, and this was to continue and assess where we are and, and where the school was uh, with the various concerns that we had initially. Uh, for instance, one concern was making sure that the time spent uh, recruiting wasn't lost with other minority uh, affairs that were important, but we did not want to take away from the recruitment. Uh, it also addressed resource allocation uh, and the need to uh, look at various roles and solutions. Next slide. Okay, and I believe Dalton Atkinson is going to share the next few slides. All right, next slide. <clears throat> All right, Joyce, I, I need to talk about uh, the statement of concerns that was made in the early 1970s. And you can see that there were a tremendous amount of progress made. And this was uh, exemplified by their ability to be able to work with the school to create that new position uh, that uh, Bill Small came into. Now in the 1972 to 76 period, uh, the caucus kind of extended these statements of concerns. And it was really based off of a survey of minority students that was done in 1972. And there was a couple of interesting kinds of facts that came out in that particular survey. One was a, a perception among the minority students that the School of Public Health, Health Leadership was committed to making meaningful change. And that this commitment was more than just lip service. So that really was a a, uh, a feeling of the, of the minority students at that particular point. The other thing that they saw happening was that they were beginning to see that the healthcare system was transitioning more towards the needs of minority communities. And so that that was becoming a bigger part of what public health was going to be dealing with in the, uh, in the future. 
But one of the things that they did not see uh, was that the corresponding shift in the school's academic training. Um, and then third was a belief from the minority students that the health needs and problems of minority communities was interrelated with social problems and issues. And there was this, this feeling among the students that there needed to be improved recognition within the school of this interrelatedness between health and social needs. And this really needed to lead to such things as more meaningful dialogues on health disparities, on improved discussions on minority health data, its quality, and its presentation in classroom discussions and research. Um, there was an overwhelming uh, belief or uh, perception about the negative images about minorities and minority health that was being that was coming through through the classroom um, um, settings. And then the fourth thing from that particular survey that I thought was interesting, that there was a growing segment of students, both minorities and whites, who were becoming interested in working in minority communities upon their graduation. And that the academic training that they were receiving uh, in school and the sensitivity to the health problems and needs of minority communities um, were needing some attention that had to be dealt with. Next slide. Now, in the next slide, you will see that um, using the survey results, uh, the caucus made a number of, of recommendations uh, to the dean. And this was in late 1974, early 1973. And I'm gonna only focus on just two of those because I think that those were sort of the precursors to us get into annual minority health conference. Number one was that new course considerations on the content and presentation of data on the health status and needs of minorities were needed. Uh, the minority students who responded in that survey believed that these considerations were needed across all departments and faculty. So this was something that they now were beginning to move into the course content and what needed to be done and the focus and so forth, and especially as it dealt with minority uh, students. And then the second one was the initiation of faculty and research seminars that focused on minority health and the interrelatedness of social and health problems in the minority community and the impact of each public health discipline had on these set of problems. So they wanted to have uh, more attention than what they were getting on that area. The second area that came out in terms of these recommendations were needed to have more research being conducted related to minorities. Now, one of the things that the survey respondents believed was that these seminars and the research should tap the wealth of knowledge and talents of black professionals and others. And this, and remember, the number of black professionals now were beginning to grow in, in health and public health, rather than just relying upon on, on the faculty. Now, we, we know that there was support for these seminars but our records are a little bit skimpy as to their implementation. We know that seminars were held, as I described above, but have not yet been able to document, we haven't been able to document the number of seminars nor the topics. We found, for example, a seminar that was given by a Dr. Paul Connolly, who was uh, with the United Mine Workers Welfare and Retirement Fund at the time, and he came to the school and talked about health in the black community. And this was in 1974. We also found in caucus minutes um, of upcoming seminars 
by Mayor Coleman Young, who was the mayor of Detroit at the time, and Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. But again, but for either one of those, we have not been able to document the dates and the titles of their presentations. Now, we really believe that these seminars were the precursors to taking the next step in 1977 about doing a full-fledged annual minority health conference. Um, when we get to the open forum session, we would like to hear fr from more of you, especially individuals who were at the school in the 1974 to 77 period about your memories of these seminars and any discussions and would be great if they have documents on the transition from the seminar format to a conference format. But again, we believe that these seminars were the beginning uh, of that discussions about uh, having additional training at the School of Public Health on minority health and working with the minority communities. Okay, next slide, and I think it's Vic. Uh, okay. Or Anita. Okay, thank you. Uh, many, some of you may recognize Jim Morrell to the left and Bill Jenkins that you heard about this morning uh, to the right. That was something uh, developed called a survival committee, but it started informally when Jim Morrell, who was then the only black professional in epidemiology, who provided taught various labs in, uh, I think it was Val Statistics. Uh, what Jim said, it was interesting as black students came in, when they saw, would see him, they would often seek him out because they thought he felt some of what they felt and would be able to relate to them if they needed assistance. And he actually started informal tutoring and when Bill Jenkins came uh, as a uh, professor in epidemiology, uh, as I recall, then he and Jim decided to start what they call a survival committee to help students that may need assistance in epidemiology and biostatistics. And their mission was that no black student should re receive less than a B in epidemiology and biostatistics. And this was between 75 and 77, and they accomplished their mission. I'll let you hear just a little bit from them. Uh, you know, the idea was to set a mission, and the mission was uh, to make sure that no black student got less than a B. Uh, and by sat in Epic. At least that was my, you know, I find it as the mission of what I call the survival committee. And, um, so we met on a regular basis and formed a more structure. It, it's my nature to form the structure. And, um, and after the first year, I think it was, no black student got less than a B. And that's when we said, oh, hey, we got this go. We got this now, you know? And then we just did it uh, until eventually I left. Yeah, so. Um, but it was something that I, and, and because of the survival committee, uh, it changed from the black caucus to the minority caucus. Yes. Because Native Americans came, you know, we had our honorary black person, Danny Ng. <laughs> um, Sherry Bleasley and yeah. the Gray Boys. There were two Gray Boys, Dean, and I never could remember what the other one. And the rest were black. Um, and so it was not just the course, it became more social, and then um, at some point we decided we wanted to make an impact, and one of those things was to, uh, uh, Bob Kelly had uh, 
propose having a minority of Congress. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, you know, the And this is the program from the very first uh, Black Health Conference, our Minority Health Conference. And next slide. And you can, we'll have these available so you can see the persons involved uh, in planning it. I did see Doris Magwood's name and uh, many others. Next slide. Looks a little bit different from today's, right? <laughs> okay. Whenever we talk about School of Public Health, there are special people, several of us remember, that don't always get the attention that faculty members receive. Remember, we had very, a lot of supportive faculty, but there were other supportive individuals as well. Uh, we are calling them unsung heroes, or not so hidden figures. Uh, you'll play that for us again, Bill Jenkins speaking. Oh, let me mention one person who is a real hero here. That people, you know, Mr. Land. Mr. Land was the AV person at this school. But Mr. Land knew the faculty, the staff, community people. Um, and he was an advisor, a mentor to us. Yeah, a mentor to us. Um, and yet, you know, for a student who thought they were so and so important and blah, 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 they would never have asked Mr. Land advice about what to do there at the school. And yet, in my mind, he was one of the most important student advisors for minority students at the school. And it's unfortunate that he's not here now, because if he was here instead of me to tell you about how the school is run and what you should do and the people you should seek support from and the people you should not seek support from mm -hmm. and stuff like that, this was Mr. Land, a, an incredible resource that would probably never go down in the history of this school. Thank you. Next slide. You know, um, that one play for us, Morgan. I've been living here 50 years. Uh, I knew when I first came, or oh, there might have been three, maybe four other black people on that campus right. <laughs> that were, uh, you know, faculty. I got to know a lot of the uh, people who were housekeeping and yard men, people mm -hmm. like that. And my father was pastoring churches about 20 miles from the campus. So I, I had this kind of dual vision where, you know, up at the School of Public Health, this guy is a janitor, he pushes a broom. But out in the community, he may be the head man at the church right. that uh, determines a lot of what goes on socially. And, and I, I remember the chairman of my department uh, was kind of curious as to, well, how are you getting along in the community? and. Uh, I guess people will seek you for a position of leadership. <laughs> kind of doubt that. <laughs> um, I say, you know, but if you want to find a leader, you, you talk to Clyde. That's the guy that pushes the broom up and down this hall. Um, he's an organizer. He's a visionary. Mm -hmm. He has three children, and he's got him in college, he's trustworthy. And uh, that kind of surprised the guy Stewart, uh, you know, and he said, well, what, what is your relationship? And I said, well, it kind of depends. Uh, and that most 
people try to find structure in an environment that's comfortable to them and that I was doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. But uh, I remember this again at School of Public Health, maybe I'd been there a year, and one of the housekeeping men said, uh, we'd like to have lunch with you sometime. I said, sure. And uh, he said, well, you know, he set a date and a week or so ahead. And uh, I went to have lunch with three housekeepers. Mm -hmm. And they had a table spread with a white cloth. And they said, look, we're glad you're here. And uh, we, we pray for this kind of change. Uh, and if there's anything we can do to make it comfortable for you, we want you to know that we're with you. Well, that was probably one of the more deeply felt mm -hmm. endorsements of my presence uh, than I'd ever had before. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, you know, um, that was Ben Money conduct, conducting that interview that you'll hear from later. And thanks to UNC and Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center for collaborating on the production of that video and specifically the AV department with OJ McGee and uh, Dan Beaver, Denver. Denver. Man. <laughs> All right, thank you. Next slide. Uh, just recognizing other people. If you know other heroes, please let us know about them. Vic, uh, if you'll share some of the data you collected for us. Okay, these, these, these data are very much thanks to the School of Public Health. Um, Desha Lima Rojas gave me the data for this one. Uh, the slide shows the percentage of Black, American Indian, and Latinx students among 367 domestic students, not international, who reported a single ethnicity, so no missing data and no multiple race ethnicities. The slide shows that that percentage grew from about 6.3% in September 1971, shortly before Bill Small arrived and before the caucus was founded, to over 12% for each of the following three years. Thereafter, that percentage was attained only occasionally until 2001, when there were then 1,068 domestic students reporting a single ethnicity. So the numbers went up, but the percentage didn't actually increase. Minority percentages rose in the 21st century, along with increases in the school certificate, bachelor's, and online programs, so that in 2020, the corresponding percentage of those three ethnicities was 21%, or 308, number of 308. And then there were 68 other students reporting multiple ethnicities. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, the larger goal is degree completion and not all students who enroll depart with a degree. So this graph shows the number of African-American, American Indian and Latinx graduates from the School of Public Health, beginning with the first two African-American MPH graduates in 1962, and it runs through 2002. Because the numbers are small, the graph looked jittery. So I am showing five-year moving averages. For African-Americans, you can see the dramatic growth during the 1970s following the founding of the caucus and the arrival of Bill Small. But the growth then slows, up, slows until the end of the century. Growth in American Indian graduates also levels off. Only Latinx graduate numbers continue to grow, uh, reflecting their increasing population in the state. These data are preliminary since there are a number of data challenges, including privacy protection, missing data, and classification issues. So um, nevertheless, uh, as we will hear in the next slide, the school's commitment to increasing the diversity in the school has been strong for many decades. Thank you, Nita. Thank you. For the sake of time, 
I'm not going to play this video, but you can hear what uh, Bill Small, I want you to see Bill Small, who has been so critical in these efforts, um, had to say about at the very top, the administration's commitment to change for the better. And these will be available to you. Uh, Bill, those were the main words that uh, Bill had to say. He was a guest at another event. Uh, next slide. If I had to say. I want to make sure we have time for reflections uh, from John Hatch, Walter Isaacs, and Ben Money. And John, I believe you're on the line. John, can you hear me? Can you unmute? Okay, if not, let me go to um, Walter Isaacs, who is one of the founding uh, members. Walter, can you hear me? Okay, they may be having trouble with their sound. We're being technologically challenged. Well, while we're waiting to see if they're able to unmute, uh, it's been money on. Yes, Anita, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all the organizers of this conference and, uh, um, and all the participants. Uh, I particularly want to thank Bill Small. Um, my name is Ben Money. I'm Deputy Secretary for Health Services at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, my boss, Dr. Mandy Cohen, uh, sends you greetings um, from Raleigh. Um, obviously, we're uh, quite involved in uh, mitigating the COVID-19 pandemic, but she clearly recognizes, as do I, the importance of this conference and really the importance of the legacy of the work that has taken place uh, by minority students and faculty at UNC. So let me tell you a little bit about, a little bit about me. Um, I actually came uh, to Chapel Hill in 1984. And I came really out of, I would say, frustration, a little bit of desperation. Um, I had uh, grown up in Massachusetts and, and started my career there in, in community-based behavioral health. And, you know, after uh, five years, really was was pretty burned out, uh, and didn't really see good prospects up there. And when I uh, was an undergraduate at Springfield College, my faculty advisor in health education always said, "You know, if you want to get an MPH, go to UNC Chapel Hill, go to School of Public Health there." And so I actually one day after a very exhausting and frustrating week, got in my car on a Friday in February, February 1984, and literally drove down to Chapel Hill from Massachusetts straight. I didn't have a name. Well, I had names of people that were in my fraternity, but I didn't have, I didn't know anybody. And so I connected with people when I got there, um, uh, the, the brothers in my fraternity helped me uh, sort of navigate the weekend while I was there. I actually got into a UNC NC State basketball game for free. Um, <laughs> I won't tell you how that worked, but let's just say I didn't have a seat, but I had a Coke in my hand the whole time. Got a chance to see Michael Jordan play and, you know, Spud Webb, Lorenzo Charles. It was, it was pretty amazing. And came away from that weekend going, got to go to Chapel Hill. My contract with the behavioral health agency I was working with ended, and uh, you know I decided I was just going to move down. It was just, you know, I was going to take a shot at life. Single, didn't have any obligations, um, but I didn't have a job. I was able to connect up and just sort of, you know, kind of couch surf and eventually got a place with a, a brother in my fraternity, but um, really didn't have a. a, a any, anything but a desire to go to UNC. And so I said, you know what? You need to talk to Bill Small, okay? Mr. Small, I will connect with Mr. Small. And uh, so I, I, I set up an appointment and he was very gracious. Um, and I brought my transcript and 
I, I just remember him sitting and, and looking at my transcript and shaking his head, saying, Money, you got a lot of work to do. <laughs> he said, But if you want to get into Carolina, if you want to get in school of public health, let me tell you what you need to do. And he actually sat me down and step by step told me everything that I needed to do. Uh, he told me about a program that was actually at UNC called the Reading Program. I was like, the reading program? Why not read? It's like, no, no, no. This, this is a program that will help you study for the GRE because that was my rate, one of my rate limiting steps among many at the time was the GRE. Um, but it was also a program that actually helped you learn how to speed read. I use those techniques to this day. Um, so I, I followed everything that he did. And then I would keep up, you know, and just let him know what my progress was. Um, I was able to get my GRE score above the minimum. Well, actually a little bit more than above the minimum. Uh, he helped me and with my statement of purpose. Um, he would, you know, read it, edit it, give me some feedback, and then suggested faculty members that um, I should meet with. I was kind of on the cusp between um, continuing with health education and getting a master's or um, going into nutrition. And so we talked about that and I elected to, to go into nutrition. Um, so, you know, after a year really of, of preparation, I applied to the graduate program. Uh, and fortunately I got in. And not only did I get in, I actually got uh, the Minority Presence Fellowship, which actually helped me pay for school because I, I didn't really have that figured out either. Um, so from there, you know, career in public health, community health centers, and now, you know, with uh, DHHS as a deputy secretary. And I, I can actually say without hesitation that I would not be here today if it were not for Bill Small. He literally changed my life and actually the destiny of my future generations. I've got a daughter who's a physician. I've got a son who will be an attorney at the end of this year. Um, I've got another daughter who will be a school teacher at the end of next year. I mean, actually changed my life and the life of my children and their destiny as well. So I cannot be more grateful for what Bill Small has done for me. And I know he's done for many others. Mine is just just a small example of the impact that one man with an open door and a huge heart has had on, on one person, and that's me. So, Anita, just thank you so much for the opportunity to just share that, that really personal story. Um, there are others that I could talk about as well. Many are on this call, um, Delton Atkinson and, and Dr. Hatch, who've been in, incredibly impactful in my life. I want to just talk about Bill and what he's done. So thank you. Thank you, Ben. We appreciate that. And uh, we wish Bill could be here with us. He had hoped he could, but he wasn't sure. Uh, you heard Dr. Uh, Dean Reimer mention some health concerns, but he is here in spirit with us, and we'll make sure he hears this. I wonder if there are questions in the chat uh, box. Morgan, can you look at the chat box for us? Any questions? There are no questions currently, Nina, though I'm sure some will come flooding in and I have some here as well. Um, so if you are waiting for a question, we can wait for those. Otherwise, I know you have a, a couple more slides here, so I'll let you decide what to do. Okay. I'll do the next slide. Okay, inclusive excellence. You've heard Stephanie Baker, uh, who is co-chair of the new committee being established by the alumni committee, uh, to pick up really on some of the same things we are discussing here. Uh, looking at minority students, minority faculty, and how we can assist uh, including post-graduation. And I won't go over that since we did that uh, earlier, but we hope you will join us. And thanks, Stephanie, for your announcement. Next slide. And these are the acknowledgements and credits. There are many people to be acknowledged and provided credit. 
Again, these will be available for you. Next slide. We will post this, these slides and the links to the video under, Vic is always uh, doing websites and you can see the website listing there. And plus feel free to contact any of us with additional information. Okay, I'm gonna go back now and thank you so much for this opportunity and thanks to the school for supporting the Black Health Caucus. Uh, and the continued work, both from the beginning up through now. Uh, Morgan, I will check and see if John Hatch and Walter Isaacs were able to uh, get their audio working, unless you see additional questions, see some questions. If not, we'll take your question. Yes, we do have a question in the chat. I think they are still working on their audio. They're definitely here with us, but I don't believe we can hear them at this moment. So the question in the chat for you, Anita, and the other speakers are, what do you imagine and hope for for the future of the Minority Student Caucus? Okay, Dalton, why don't I let you and Vic, I've done a lot of talking, take first stab at that. I've been. Okay. Well, I can say what I hope for, even though I was never officially a member of the caucus. I was a faculty advisor for a number of years. Uh, I'd really like to see the caucus connect more strongly with the caucus alumni, because there will always be too limited a number of minority students in the school. But the number of alumni now, that community has grown substantially, and many of them are well connected. Uh, some of them are even retired and have some time on their hands. So I think that the movement could be greatly strengthened by increasing the numbers, the networking opportunities, and the perspective that the alumni can bring. So I'm hoping that this new inclusive excellence effort and the Minority Student Caucus can connect more strongly with the alumni. And Stephanie Baker, who asked the question, would be a great person to lead that effort. And she is. <laughs> We're looking forward to that. Um, and what I'd like to see and like to offer is um, just greater engagement with North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Um, I think that um, we, not only during this event, but really throughout the year, uh, can foster and facilitate more opportunities for experiential learning, um, not only in Raleigh, but through our um, offices and uh, through our local health departments uh, throughout the state of North Carolina. So, you know, I think that there can be, I think a greater affinity and alliance uh, with our groups. And I look forward to helping to facilitate that. Thank and, you. and Ben, I think you hit for me a, a very good point that I was gonna talk about is that connectivity. Um, and, and I have sort of an affinity for the, the public sector because that's where I spent my entire career uh, at. And um, the, there is the number of, of uh, minorities who are now in very good positions around the, around the country. Um, I, I know that when I was working, um, there, there were students that I had who uh, worked under me, who worked with me, and um, I, I would like to see that strengthened. Thank you, Delton. I'm glad uh, that that question came up. In fact, that was one of the concerns of the original Black Health Caucus. We had said we wanted to continue to stay connected and serve as a resource for graduates, mm -hmm. and I think we could do a whole lot to make that happen now. Yeah. And the other and the other thing they just make sure that is, is to see that the minority graduates are still continue to be very active with the school mm -hmm. from the various committees uh, that the school has um, and, and so forth. Um, for example, I served on the School of Public Health Foundation Board for a number of years. Uh, so having minorities very active in those uh, 
and those various entities would be something that I would also want to see as well. Thank you. And are we able to unmute Stephanie? Yes, I was just going to bring that up. Stephanie, it looks like you have something to share with us. Please go ahead. Yes. Well, since Vic, you know, put my name out there, I just <laughs> wanted to invite um, folks to join the Inclusive Excellence Committee of the Alumni Advisory Board. We really look forward to connecting with you all in all of the ways that you just mentioned. And I put the link in the chat. People will be getting an email. We're going to be you know, trying to find you <laughs> so that you can join us because we need your wisdom, we need your energy, you need your, we need your insight, and we need that connection, and we need that continued connection so that we don't lose these important relationships and this important history, and we're able to connect our current students. And so um, it's uh, go.unc.edu slash alumni inclusive excellence. And I just wanted to um, invite folks to join with us in that space. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. We really appreciate it. And thank you for all your service. Are there any other questions or comments? Any more reflections? I'd love to see a documentary made about the activities and minority related activities. I know people are not crazy about the term minority and I'm not wedded to it, but that's the one I grew up with. Um, going back to the 1940s, right to the present, uh, I think this is an incredible story as part of the long civil rights movement. Be careful with Vic. Vic will put you to work. <laughs> but I've, I'll give you lots of archival resources and video, and it audio. adds a lot to it. Vic has, thank goodness he has kept so many of these documents. Okay. I'd like to say, this is Victoria. Oh, and I have, I have enjoyed tremendously looking at the history that I didn't have when I was, was there. I only heard tidbits every now and then, but it was, um, you all did a wonderful job of bringing it down home and um, you know, I'm hoping that I'll get a chance to sit down and see the thing, see it all over again to really comprehend. Thanks so much, Victoria. And I uh, should have mentioned that you've reminded me, I've heard that wonderful interview that you've done with Vic about the Minority Health Caucus. Were you on the planning committee for the first one in 1977? I didn't see my name. I was there. I remember being there, um, you know, but it wasn't like it was, took a whole lot of plans for that first one, it you know, because you have to remember, uh, wasn't the, the speaker, wasn't he almost a graduate student there? And, and um, you know, so it wasn't like it was a whole lot of planning right. other than getting the facility, you know, getting the room reserved and, 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 and at that point. So the first one wasn't as as um, detailed as you know getting people from coming from out of town like we did the second year. Okay, and I think the first one, uh, 1977, the keynoter, I believe, was Floyd McKissick, who was a strong civil rights right. opponent, and he was running what was known as Soul City in Warren County. Yes. And yes. I this was, it was done also in conjunction with the, was it the Student Health Council Caucus? It was co-sponsored. Uh, Student Union. Planned it. Student Union. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Union, thank you all. Used all uh, of this memory. And, but wasn't Kelly, um, Kelly, uh, somebody named Kelly, he was, he was there part of, uh, of Soul City, but he was in graduate school or something there. Yeah. At the time. He invited Bob. Bob okay. invited Floyd McKissick. And that, I think, was the connection. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture of that, of part of that uh, forum with Floyd McKissick that Vic has in his archives again. Thank you so I much. I apologize to interrupt y'all. We're going to run out of time here. We're already a little over time. But I think this is a beautiful testament to the community that happens and the community that can happen. So I want to take a moment to thank all of our speakers, a virtual round of applause, 
and, and a very large thank you to all of you for being here and sharing this history with us. Um, and for those of you who, who set all of this in motion and brought us to where we are today. So thank you all so very much. Um, and if, if our speakers have any closing remarks before we get pushed out of our pathable room here and, and funneled back to the, the larger conference, you are welcome to bring those here. So thank you. Well, I'll be very brief again. Thank you so much for everyone, the speakers, the participants, and we'll just adjourn until you join Inclusive Excellence with Stephanie and I. So stay tuned for part two. Uh, other speakers have comments? I wanna thank Anita for doing a Herculean job. And I wanna thank John Hatch and Fleedra Hatch and Walter and Jane Isaacs for doing their darndest to try to join us and they prepared and everything and then they've had audio issues and in the end they couldn't make it. I just got a text from Jane. Oh, thanks, Vicki. Yes, we regret so much that they are, they were committed and they have worked on this, okay. Delta. Thank you all for coming. Yes, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay.